May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be always acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Amen. What's it all about, Alfie? Do you recall that song from, 19, from the 1960s? It was made famous by Dionne Warwick. It was written for a movie exploring the meaning of life and love. Or how about the Peggy Lee song from the same time period? Is that all there is? Now some of you are probably too young to remember that, but you may have heard that song. That one is such a sad and depressing song. It's about a person's disillusionment with life's experiences, both good and bad. Even death is seen as a disappointment. The Austrian psychiatrist and existentialist Viktor Frankl wrote a book titled Man's Search for Meaning. He was a prisoner in four different concentration camps during World War II where he experienced unimaginable suffering and loss, including the loss of his pregnant wife. His book explores the basic questions of why we are here on earth and what gives our lives meaning. He went on to develop a form of psychotherapy based on the premise that humans are motivated by a will to find meaning for our lives. It seems to be part of our human nature to ask questions about the meaning and purpose of our lives. We search for what we think will bring happiness in life. We're seeking the good life, and we want rational and logical explanations for everything. The search may result in feelings of emptiness, an unexplainable void, or a lack of fulfillment. The search may lead to depression, or we may attempt to fill that void with addictions, such as alcohol, drugs, sex, pornography, or anything that creates a momentary high or feeling of elation. We may expect to find a relationship that will fulfill us that one perfect relationship. Some people are driven to acquire great wealth or become obsessed with work. We have an unquenchable desire for what promises to satisfy us. At some point, we realize that none of these attempts will truly satisfy our hungry souls. Some people just give up the search and resign themselves to a mediocre and boring existence. Others keep searching for the meaning of life. Many books have been written by those who think they have the answers. As Christians, we know that only God can satisfy that deeper longing of our hearts. Only God can fill the empty places in our lives. It is God who put that longing in our hearts for Him. Sadly, though, even Christians are tempted to run after false promises to bring happiness and meaning to life. The Old Testament book of Ecclesiastes has caught my attention. It resonates with me because I have asked many of these questions of life. Why do things happen the way they do? What is the reason for my being here at this time and this place? What will I be able to say at the end of my life? I also recognize the powerful warning to all Christian believers that we are subject to the temptations of the world, just as much as those who do not adhere to our beliefs about God. There have been times in my life when I chose a path of disobedience over obedience, and my relationship with God became shaky ground for a while. This path of sin can be conscious and deliberately rebellious, or it can be a subtle drifting away, one step at a time. One day, you find yourself with a completely different worldview, which reduces God to something less than He is and places ourselves at the center of the universe. That happened in my life. It's probably happened more than once, but the one time I'm thinking about took me away from God for 25 years. Perhaps some of you have had similar experiences. It was through God's grace and mercy and His love for me that He brought me back to Him. Ecclesiastes is complex, and it has a certain rhythm to it. 
with several literary styles in which the author is asking probing questions from his human perspective about why he is here and what is the meaning of everything. On the surface, he sounds depressed and pessimistic, but he interjects references throughout to his faithfulness in God. One of his findings is best described in chapter 3, verse 11. He has made everything beautiful in his time. Also, he has put eternity into man's heart. Yet so, he cannot find out what God has done from beginning to end. God is the answer to all of our questions because it is God who sets everything in motion from beginning to end. Let's look at our passage from Ecclesiastes this morning. In chapter 1, verse 1, the author identifies himself as the preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem. It is unknown exactly who wrote the book of Ecclesiastes. Bible scholars are in disagreement about this. Some say the evidence points to a later time period than the time of Solomon's life, but others believe Solomon is the writer because of this mention in the first verse and the subsequent references to the accomplishments and wisdom of Solomon. Either way, the Hebrew word is koheleth, which is translated as the convener of an assembly, or teacher, or preacher. Our translation uses preacher. Eugene Peterson in the message uses the term quester for the writer. We know that the preacher is a man of great wisdom. He uses his experience and observations to ponder the meaning of life. I prefer to think it is Solomon who wrote this book, Although there was a debate as to whether it should even be included in the Old Testament canon, it is there, and it's placed between two other books by Solomon, Proverbs and the Song of Songs. Solomon was the wisest man in the world, and his life is an example of what happens when we open the door to sin and knowingly disobey God. Let's review what we know about King Solomon. He was the son of David and Bathsheba. He became king when he was very young. We don't know exactly what age, but we know he was young. We know from 1 Kings that Solomon had a close, intimate relationship with God. God spoke to him in dreams at least two times, and Solomon was told to ask for whatever he wanted from God. And I know you remember this story. He asked for great wisdom because he knew he was getting ready to be king. Because he asked for such a gift instead of material things, God blessed him with great wealth and possessions. He had a reputation far and wide for his wisdom and accomplishments. His greatest accomplishment was the building of the temple in Jerusalem. He was a statesman, a merchant, an administ administrator. Solomon had everything but still he was not satisfied. So he married a foreign woman. This was in direct disobedience to God's command to the Israelites, and it led to his subsequent downfall and the tarnishing of his great reign as king. Unfortunately, one thing led to another, and he had 700 foreign wives of royal birth and 300 concubines before he was finished. We've looked at this in the Mary Point Bible study, and we as a bunch of women had a lively and humorous discussion about Solomon's attraction to foreign women. We don't know what he was thinking. What could he possibly have been thinking? And we could not conceive, this was the big part, we could not possibly conceive how he coped with a thousand women. Now we were looking at it from a woman's perspective, and at best we decided each wife might see her woman once every three years, and then he wouldn't know her name. It was beyond our understanding, but this is where we find King Solomon. He is near the end of his life, or at least later in years, and he gives us a discourse on what he has learned about the meaning of everything under the sun. Ecclesiastes at first appears to be a sad and dismal account of a wise and godly man who opened the door to sin. Then he kept going until he found himself far away from God and wallowing in negativity. There were consequences for Solomon and his descendants. 
In verse two of chapter one, we read, vanity of vanities, says the preacher, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. You may recall other translations say, meaningless, meaningless, all is meaningless. This is the ongoing theme of Ecclesiastes. The preacher expounds on this observation, exploring different topics from his experience, such as wealth, work, wisdom, self-indulgence, and time. But he draws the same conclusion. Life has no meaning without God. All is vanity, just a vapor, a breath of air, a fleeting moment, something that is here today and gone tomorrow. Life is utterly futile and meaningless. Sounds pretty depressing, doesn't it? In the remaining verses of chapter one, the preacher observes the cycles in nature and realizes that he cannot understand the things he sees. The sun rises and the sun sets and then it rises again. The wind blows from north and from the south and then it goes around again. The streams flow into the ocean, but the ocean never gets full. He makes the famous observation in verse nine that what has been is what will be, and what has been done is what will be done, and there is nothing new under the sun. That's a familiar line to us. My mother used to say that all the time. There's nothing new under the sun. In verse 13, he says, and I applied my heart to seek and search out by wisdom all that is done under heaven. The preacher was a seeker. It is an unhappy business that God has given to the children of man to be busy with. And in verse 14, I have seen everything that is done under the sun, and behold, all is vanity and a striving after wind. The preacher, with his exhortations about life's meaning, does what every generation tries to do. We cannot fully understand all that is, only what our limited wisdom and experience can tell us. Ecclesiastes is a book written for both believers and non-believers. It might comfort some to know that they are not alone in their thoughts about the futility of life. Some may just resign themselves to this existence believing that life is only as good as the pleasure we seek and find. A non-believer reading Ecclesiastes may be able to grasp the reality of a sovereign God who has everything in his hands and is in control of his creation. The beauty in this book for us as Christians is the way it points us to our reality, which is the kingdom of God, where God is in control of all that is and ever will be. He is sovereign. He is the creator of everything. He is, as described by one scholar, unsearchable wisdom. He puts a longing in our hearts that causes us to ask important questions and search for answers. But we can't see the whole plan unfolding and our answers to the questions of life turn out to be just guesses. However, a great plan is unfolding before us and we play only a small part one chosen for us by God. This gives meaning to our lives. The preacher makes us wait until chapters 11 and 12 of Ecclesiastes to tell us his conclusion about life. It is this, the only thing that really matters is that we fear God and obey God. We can see the darkness of pain, suffering, addictions, pornography, violence, abortion, and all sorts of evil things the human race is doing. This darkness seems to be increasing at an alarming rate. With so much available to us, the importance of belonging to a Christian community is underscored. This is God's plan for us, and we need each other to remain faithful and stay on the straight and narrow path. Satan loves deception, and he can draw us away from what we know to be true without our realizing what is happening until we have gone too far. We need to speak into each other's lives in love when we have concerns for one of our brothers or sisters who may be stumbling. I don't know what happened in Solomon's case, but he did know what God wanted from him. He went against this for whatever reason, and it led to build, 
It led him to building statues for foreign gods at the request of his wives, and God was not pleased at his disobedience. Let's turn briefly to the passage from Mark's Gospel. We heard the familiar parables of the sower and the mustard seed. These parables describe the kingdom of God. This is the sh in sharp contrast to the world seen by the preacher in Ecclesiastes. Everything to him appeared meaningless. Without knowledge of the kingdom of God, on the surface, life does lack meaning. It is hard to know what our purpose might be for living if we don't know about the kingdom that awaits us. In the parable of the sower, the farmer plants the seeds, but he isn't the one who created that process of growth. He believes things will happen as they have always happened. He has faith in God's creation. Have you noticed the calla lilies that are planted in front of the office window? All winter they were unseen, just bulbs under the ground. But they were alive and something was happening under the ground. Then green shoots began peeking up through the dirt just a few inches high. In a very short time, just after one of those big rains, they grew several feet high and now have produced lovely flowers. I'm always amazed when I see this process. The same thing catches my attention with the cornfield across from my house. Nothing but dirt and weeds, but then corn stalks emerge and flourish until they are six feet tall. It always amazes me how quickly that happens. The mustard seed is the tiniest of seeds but it grows into a large tree with many branches. We've heard that faith as small as a mustard seed can move mountains. Our faith in God, no matter how small it is, can be, caused, can be used by God to build his kingdom. We each have a part. The life we see around us with all the cycles and seasons of nature described so beautifully in Ecclesiastes is limited by our human perspective and experience. The life we were created for is eternity with God in his kingdom. God has put a longing in our hearts for his kingdom. We are not to despair over the questions of life for which we have no answers because we have the one answer to all of our questions. It is faith in Jesus Christ and the promise of eternal life. The way to join God in his kingdom is through Jesus when we turn away from the ways of this world and turn to him, repenting for our sin and entering into a personal relationship with him. Now, just in case I ramble too much, as I'm prone to do, let me summarize the three points I want you to take away from the book of Ecclesiastes this morning. The first one is the questions of life are part of our humanness. What's our purpose? Why are we here? What gives meaning to our lives? What happens when we die? How can we fill the empty places? And the second point is, so we search. And if we open the door to sin, we start down that slippery slope and get farther and farther away from God. We begin to dwell in a reality that was not the one we were created for. It doesn't have a happy ending. And the third point is there's only one answer to the questions of life. Through our personal relationship with Jesus Christ, we have faith in the promises of God, of a life in his kingdom for eternity. Our faith is like the small mustard seed growing into one of the largest and strongest trees. God will do something with our faith. A line from St. Augustine captures the story of our lives. Thou hast made us for thyself, and our heart is restless till it rest in thee. In closing, let us pray the words of William Laud. Grant, O Lord, that we may live in thy fear, die in thy favor, rest in thy peace, rise in thy power, reign in thy glory, for thy own beloved Son's sake, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.